Okay, good. Hello, this is Al. We're coming to you from the Arts Cafe of the Kelly Writers House at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Why are you laughing, Anna? In Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, this is our first of the weekly ModPo live interactive webcast. And I am following Twitter, and next to my ModPo live feed, hashtag ModPo live feed, just happens to be uh, a search where anybody who says something about MOOCs, M-O-O-C-S, I see the feed. And there's a guy named Eric Palmer, who's not in ModPo clearly, who says, MOOCs are doomed to failure. That's his tweet. But here we are. What are we, chopped liver? We're not failed. We're doing something live and interactive and human and humane. And so I want to introduce some people. First of all, in the audience tonight, we have Evelyn, who came all the way from Atlanta, who's attending some kind of epidemiology conference? It's true. Maternal and child health epidemiology. I am hope, I hope, Jason, that ModPo is an alternative, is alt epidemiology, but I'm not sure. Welcome, Evelyn. We're so glad you're here, all the way from Atlanta. We have Mary, one of the great community TAs, who's here, and Kirby is here, and Tom is way in the back, his first time here, and of course, Eric, who's amazing, 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 also a longtime CTA. And we have a uh, personing, humaning the camera is Zach Cardner, who's actually turning the thing around. So the, there's Zach. <laughs> Hello, Zach. Zach is responsible for this shit show, the circus that we're in, this wired circus. Hey, Zach. Zach's great. And behind Zach, I can never see him, who's handling the audio and all kinds of other problems, is Chris Martin, the amazing Chris Martin. And these two, and Chris is now on the all year doing uh, presentations on this interactive ModPo webcast, and others have tried to do what we're doing, and the fact is they can't, because they don't understand that if you're not making a mistake, you're making a mistake. And we make crap loads of mistakes, and therefore it's cool, yeah. Okay, and now the TAs, and we'll move right into your questions. Uh, so this is, there's Anna Strong. Oops, I'm throwing you for a loop. There's Anna Strong, and Anna is a, one of the original TAs. This is her first, first year, fifth year at ModPo, and she is um, personing the phones. And so 215-573-9752, um, 215-573-9752. And if you're the second caller today, I will make sure that you receive the second caller, not the first will receive a copy of a book. I brought three books that we're going to be mailing to you just as a bonus for calling. Okay, so that's Anna Strong. Hello, Anna. Hi, Al. Lily Applebaum is to my far right, but everyone's Hello. far left. <laughs> Hello, Lily Applebaum. Maybe she's not the everyone. best. I don't know. <laughs> Kamara is here, and Kamara Brown is here, and she's the, grass. She's the greatest. She's Hi. Best. She's great. Thanks. I'm stumbling over my words because your, your greatness is overwhelming me. <laughs> Thanks. Welcome. You're great, too. Welcome. I, that was kind of a setup. And yeah. Emily <laughs> Harnett, who likes to sit way back and then move forward to talk. <laughs> Emily, hello. 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 Carlos is here. Hello, Carlos. How are hello. you? I'm good. You excited? Yeah. Okay. And Gabe is here. And, and, and Gabe is he's relatively new to ModPo, but he's also a teaching assistant, as are others here in English 88, which is the original course that used to be taught separately, but it's 31 years old, and now it's part of ModPo, and we'll explain that some other time. And remotely, coming in through Google Hangouts, we have, to our right, I don't think she perceives it this way, Erica Kaufman, who is an amazing person, a director type, I, I guess you're like director, associate director, supreme director, whatever it is, Czar of the Center for, oh, I'm going to get this wrong, um, Writing and Thinking at Bard College. You want to say hello? Erica, we can't hear you, so you must be mu muted somehow. Hello, Erica. Okay. Erica may be muted, but we'll fix that. Hello, Erica, coming to us from Bard College. And next to Erica, in our view, is Max McKenna, who is somewhere on a street of Chicago. Hello, Max. Can you hear us? Max, can you hear us? Okay. Zach and Chris are going to work on some muting problems. And then there's Dave Poplar, who is in Massachusetts. Dave, are you there? Can you hear us, Dave? And he cannot. He's giving us a quizzical look. Okay. 
Hello, Dave. All right, this is fun. It's not working yet, but Chris and Zach will figure it out. And then there's Amaris Kachansky, the great Amaris Kachansky, who's somewhere near Cape Cod or somewhere east of Boston. Hello, Amaris. You can't hear us, but hello. And then there's Ali Castleman, who is in New York. New York, New York. So hello. 215-573-9752. And there is someone already on the phone. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about Whitman and Dickinson because this is week one of ModPo. Ten-week symposium. ModPo's site, its new site, will be open forever. But right now we're in what we call symposium mode where we go ten weeks all together. This is week one. And there are five ways to interact with us. I'll tell you what they are, and then we're going to the phone. First, you can tweet at us using hashtag ModPoLive, ModPoLive. You can also direct your tweet to our Twitter handle, which is at ModPoPen. Either way, we'll get to see you. A second way to interact, you can go to our Facebook page, and you can post comments underneath. I don't know if it's really happening. Do we hit play? Flash unavailable, so I can't do it on there. Um, hmm. Uh, you can go to the Facebook group, ModPo Facebook group, and watch the video stream. I there. have the stream comments. You have the stream. So you can type comments as you normally would on a Facebook page. That's way interactive way number two. Thirdly, you can go to a ModPo subforum. So you go to the ModPo site, you go to discussion forums, then you go to live webcast sessions, and then you find a subforum, and Gabe, who's going to say hello, Hi. Gabe is watching that subforum, and there's already some chitter chatter there. And you can call us at 215-573-9752, which is the fourth way to interact with us. And the fifth way, kind of too late now, but you can always send a voicemail, which we, between uh, webcasts, Hey, Evelyn, is this confusing and crazy, this circus? This is crazy, isn't it? It's Overwhelming. Fantastic. It's fantastic, she said. <laughs> um, the fifth way is to leave us a voicemail at the ModPo voicemail box. And that number is 512-95-MODPO, 512-95-MODPO. So let's go to the phone, and then Gabe will find out if there's something in the forums, and then Lily will tell us what's going on on Facebook. So Anna, who do we have on the phone? We have our old friend Sophia calling from Glen Ellen, California. Oh, Yay. Sophia Pandea? Yeah. <gasps> and she just wants to say hi. Okay, so, that's great. So now, up. let's test our audio guys, because they haven't done this in about six months. <laughs> Sophia, can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly. Great. Well, Chris is going to bring your voice up in this room so we can all hear you. Let's try it again. Hello, Sophia. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you perfectly. Ah, uh, Wonderful. There you are, and you've been with ModPo three, four, maybe even five years? I think it's been four years. I think this is the fourth year, I think. It's <laughs> great. And you are a poet. You are a poet. And I know you're modest about it, but you're a poet, and a fine poet, an active poet. And you, um, I think 24 years ago, came to the United States. Is that right? From Pakistan, am I right? From uh, Pakistan, and then, well, actually, Thailand. I was in Pakistan. I was born in Pakistan, but mm. then went to Thailand, and then came to the States. Well, we're so glad that you're with us in San Francisco, and you know we're coming out to San Francisco, right? Wow, that's very cool. I live about an hour away. Like, in Are you in saying you live an hour away? We're coming... A we're yeah, I could probably make it out there. We're coming across the country. You have to, you have to come <laughs> in an hour. We're going to send information, but it's early October, and we're going to be doing a live webcast on, Zach, Thursday, October 6th. We're doing a live webcast, 6 p.m. Okay. local time, at Coursera's headquarters in Mountain View, California. And then that Saturday, which is, I think, the 8th, we're going to be doing a ModPo meetup at the Center for the Book in California, so we hope to, that you'll come. Wow, that's amazing. I'd like to meet you. We've never met. Yes, that would be incredible. Great. Do you, have a, do you want to make a comment or say hello or ask a question? I just want to say hello. <coughs> it's amazing to meet 
to be, um, you know, in this wonderful community. It's so warm. And uh, since we're discussing Emily, uh, every time I read uh, that poem, I dwell in possibility, I notice something new. So this time I noticed when she said, the spreading wide my narrow hands, I noticed that line is actually the longest line of the poem. It is long, the spreading wide my narrow hands. And that's all I have to say. It's well, to be uh, part of this community. Thank you, Sophia. We really feel connected to you, even though we've never met, and we'll see you out there. We, you can, oh. If you hang up, listen to our responses about that line through the webcast, okay? I will. All right, great. Okay. We'll see you soon. Sophia okay. Pandea calling from California. So the spreading wide my narrow hands. It is the longest line, but metrically I don't think it is. I think it's similar to other lines. Of visitors, the fairest, the spreading wide my narrow hands. Yeah, it's, a, it's a slightly longer. Um, who wants to do it? We have the, we have the, um, we have the uh, camera facing us, so let's all do it. I'm going to try to do it, and then Kamara, you try to do it. Okay. Um, I need to put that. Spreading wide my narrow hands? We're going to do a little. Okay. I think it's this. I think I might have done that in the video four years ago, five years ago. I think it's this. I believe it's almost like Eric's looking at me like he's crazy or he's thinking I didn't get enough sleep last night or something like that. What do you think? Lily, you're not, if, you're if not it, spreading wide. I'm not yeah, spreading. Yeah, yeah. If this is it, if this is it, and I know you think maybe it isn't, it isn't what is it if it's, if, it's, if it's a book, the spreading wide? Because there's that everlasting roof. Um, what do you think? I don't know, sort of like exalting a book, lifting up in like a religious... Pose Maybe almost. offering? Yeah, offering. Um, a lift, uh, looking skyward, but also like being attached to your physicality, like because yeah. you're spreading your hands wide together, paradise, yeah. as opposed to just, um, there's like, yeah, a physicality in play. Yeah. Kamara, do you want to do it? Um, no, you got to do the, it. The hands? The hands, yeah. Well, um, I always thought it was like more of like a this thing, mm. like a spreading. Uh, That's how I thought it was. Like swimming through life. Yeah, like a, well, yeah, <laughs> like more like a dispersion type of thing. Mm. Um, but I like the, th the idea of like an offering kind of. Almost, um, you know, there's some religions, my religion, such as I have a religion, too much information, um, there is a, the, the Friday night uh, ceremony you, you kind of do this, which partly gets the Sabbath candle sense into you, but it also kind of spreads wide. I may be misreading Judaism entirely, but... But I'm also thinking it's like the opposite of like hands in prayer. Like it's like the exact opposite yes. of like keeping them close yes. to you. It's like a spreading. Yes, yes. Um, that's good. Not insular. That's good. Can we spread wide our narrow hands and do a little um, high-fiving? You okay. didn't even spread the fingers. Oh, we, oh, but are we... That's cool. That's cool. <laughs> okay. Um, I'd like to test the people in the Hangouts to see if they're there. And then we're going to go to the second phone call. And that second phone call person is going to get a book. And this is the problem with all these. Did I introduce you, Kirby? I didn't. Kirby, I did. See, they come here. They're so wonderful and loyal. And oh, and I also didn't introduce Jason. I need to do that. Um, and they get nothing, no books, because you can't call. And you could take, pick up your cell phone and call the number, and that would probably do it. Jason Zoska, who is deservedly happy, may I say, that yes, has a PhD, Dr. Jason. <laughs> Dr. Jason. And a book of poems came out in the spring. <laughs> and I am tonight going to order some copies so that the giveaways, this guy's. Oil and candle? Yeah, why are you being shy? He has a book. This guy has a book. And there are other books, other Modpo books. Anyway, there are other reasons why you're happy, but we, can I speak for us, are happy because Jason is so brilliant and he sits on the couch there, whatever that thing is, the bench, and he dispenses Modpovian brilliance. Hello, Jason, say something. Hello, Al. <laughs> <laughs> Snaps for Jason, we love him. Love is really the right word. Okay, so let's see. Erica Kaufman, can you hear me and can you speak and be heard? Hello, Erica. No, she cannot be heard, so Zach is furrowing his brows. Max, can you hear me and can you speak? I can hear you. Can you hear me all? Yes, we can. Yay, that's Max. Max McKenna, somewhere on the streets of Chicago. 
That's very As cool. As I usually am. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The streets. Of Jesus. Right. <laughs> and Max, can you say something about the meetup on Saturday? So the meetup is uh, at the Free Range office in Wicker Park. It's right near the Damon Blue Line stop for Chicago people who might be tuning in. Um, we'll be doing it at 10.30 in the morning. Uh, and I don't know, how long are we going to go? Hour and a half? I don't know. We'll do an so. hour, an hour and a half, and we'll pick two poems, and we don't know what they are yet. Possibly. Right, so Al will be there, everybody, if yeah. you didn't already catch that. <laughs> I will be there. I'm coming out. I'm going to see Max. We're having a meetup. Anybody want to come? Road trip. And then Max and I are going to go out for lunch, and maybe a few people will join us. And then we'll start drinking earlier in the day. Okay. Thank you, Max, very much. Dave Poplar, hello. Can you hear us? Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. How's Massachusetts? It's great. And how's it. philosophy? It's great. Love it. He is a philosophy man, and that's very cool. Um, thanks, Dave. Thanks for being here. Amaris Kuchansky in Massachusetts. Hello. Yes. Hello, Look at Al. you. It's so great to see you. It's really good to see you guys, too. Oh, I miss you. Here we are. <laughs> yes, I'm and in away. New York, holding down the fort, Allie Castleman. Allie, can you? Hi, Allie. Hi, Al. Wow, it's great to see you, too. She's doing some corporate thing, and there's a lot of people who need her time. She's in the middle of a meeting, probably. Not really. I'm teasing. Anyway, hi, Allie. We're going to turn no, to our... Some um, dogs came to check for bed bugs, but other than that... Okay. We're going to turn to our people in Google Hangouts in response to this phone call, but it, she's about... Are you hanging up, or is this somebody? No, I'm ready. Okay. And who is on the phone? Anna Strong. This is Grass, calling from Georgia. And it's who? Grass. Grass. Calling from Georgia. And he wants to talk about spreading hands. Okay. All right. So here we go. All right. Grass, can you hear me? Yeah. My name is actually Chris. Chris. Oh, is it Chris? <laughs> well, at least, listen, <laughs> she gave me grass. No, I repeated it. Now. <laughs> okay. Okay. At least grass. it's not crass. I still the guy that to Chicago. I mean, grass is like a cool, right? Yeah, hey, that Chris. Would be a cool name, anyway. Hey, but Chris. Like, <laughs> can you, you um? To, that's fine. Can Did you, you say grass? She said grass. I, I said grass. Really grass. Sorry. She I'm said. I'm in poetry, so I'm not. Now I got to write a poem about that. Please I do. I like the grass when I write my poem. Here's my rhyming I poem. Like a tree when I'm sitting at home, writing my poem. Okay. Chris. This is yeah. Al. Hi. I Listen, I, I want to do a one-line poem for you. Yes. Yeah, your ass is grass. Is that, does that rhyme? <laughs> Isn't that a phrase? Yeah. Do we say that poem. still? Not really. Um, it's a phrase. What I wanted to say was, um, nowadays, I heard what he was saying about the, um, the Judea, uh, the Jewish custom of um, spreading their hands. But nowadays, if you go to a regular Christian service, yeah. not necessarily um, any particular denomination, but just Christian, um, they spread their hands out wide up to God. Mm -hmm. that's it. Oh, and, yes. I um, think that's right. You know, so yeah. she could be spreading her hands yeah. up to God yes. um, to gather paradise. That's Spreading great. Spreading our hands up to God, like, for him to send down this knowledge and um, um, uh, the words for her to put down on paper. Yes. That's great, Chris. By the way, um, you have one, you're the second caller, and you get a book. No, he's not. Really? He's not technically? Wait, I got second caller. Sorry. She Who was this? Her name was Louise. She just didn't want to talk. She wanted to call and get the book? Ah. Oh, Chris... <laughs> You got screwed, so I'm going to give you a book also. Okay. So, oh, thank you. Chris, this is the book I want to give you. It's called Almost No Memory by oh, Lydia Davis. Funny, and it's not, it's prose poetry. She writes micro stories. And she is coming to the Kelly Writer's House in the spring. And you're going to find something very poetic and Dickinsonian about this. So Anna will take your address, your mailing address, and we will mail this to you as a gift from us, okay? Excellent. All right, thank you, Chris. That's so awesome, thank you. Okay, take care, we'll talk to you soon. All right, okay. so let's, let's go uh, around a little bit oh, here. So, um, so Lily, are you, you're following what, Twitter? Facebook and Twitter. All right, say something from, yeah. let's hear some Twitter uh, tweets, sure. and let's see if some of our people in Google Hangouts can respond. Okay, um, 
Let's see. Uh, having a lot of people check in and saying hi, which is really fun to read. Um, okay. Uh, Robin Hayden says, spread wide my narrow hands seems like a good way to gather paradise and pull it close. Yep. Um, Ray Maxwell says, I am, really, I am on this social construction of reality kick, and I think ED was an early practitioner. Okay. <laughs> I want you to do more tweets, but I'm going to turn to Amaris and Max. The tweet from Ray Maxwell was, I'm on this social construction of reality kick, and I think Emily was an early practitioner. I want Amaris and Max to respond to that in a few minutes, okay? All right, Lily? Um, let's see. Um, Shannon Ratliff says, Spread, Shannon. says, spreading wide my narrow hands, I see sand flowing through fingers. Um, I Time. like that. Mm -hmm. uh, Stephanie... Uh, at Z Stephanie Star says, spread hands experiencing abundance, clasped hands less. So I liked that because it's kind of like a Dickinsonian poem <laughs> of yeah. its own addressing, yes. you know, spreading versus clasped yes. hands. Um, uh, Kathy Garges or Gargus, sorry, Kathy says, what about the spreading wide my narrow hands in Dickinson means using hands to write poetry? Yes. Um, a lot of people checking in saying things like, I'm entering the house of possibility. Um, Karen Ledford invites us to come to Central Florida. So thanks, Karen. Hey, Karen. That sounds fun. Um, Does that mean Orlando? No. No, Central Florida would be... Central South. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, someone named... Ad <laughs> Gabe knows Florida. <laughs> um, <laughs> Some, someone named Admiral Waugh says, second year here, but still sadly limited in my ability to understand, but not to hear myself speak, which feels like a nice endorsement of Modpo. Um, um, <laughs> oh, uh, William Boggs says, surprised at lack of time spent on splinter in Brain Within Its Groove, because it's often tiny things that distract, like Emily Dickinson poems. Yeah. Um, That's good. Do one more. Sure. I see Bill Boggs there, and that's good. Um, a lot Stephanie of says this explanations. is fun. Shannon um, says, Lily, Emily, Carlos, Amaris, Dave, Erica. <laughs> yes, there are a lot of exclamations. <laughs> um, Shannon, we love you. Yeah, I Shannon's think. Shannon's in Texas. All right, Max and Amaris. Ray Maxwell, social construction of reality, and he thinks that Emily is... Aligning with that, Max first, comment? Um, I guess it's a good way to put it. I mean, I guess she's starting with imagination as the source of, of reality, right? So, like, you know, what you perceive is first needs to be imagined. Um, wow. But it made me think a little bit differently about the, the spreading wide the narrow hands um, as, as an occupation rather than I usually, I've always thought of it in the way that we've been talking about it recently that it's, she's kind of like collecting something, but to think yeah. of it as, as, as almost like this manipulation of the world around her, right? I think that's kind of a nice way to, to yeah. think of that phrase as well. Um, that's her occupation kind of. Yeah. Well, you said uh, something really manipulating important. Manipulating the, the parts. Mm -hmm. Max, you said something really important at the beginning there, which is that imagination is reality for Emily Dickinson. Um, Amaris, do you want to add to that? Uh, uh, is Ray on the right track? Um, sure. I guess, you know, from a biological perspective, Emily Dinkinson was a recluse <laughs> for the majority of her life. And she was a person with a lot of potential and intelligence, but because of her gender, she was limited um, in terms of her occupation. So she constructed a different and alternate reality for herself through poetry um, and opened the possibilities of imagination for herself so that um, I guess there's the... the uh, opposition between the image of her narrow hands and the power that they hold in creating works pioneered with a new approach to poetry. That's very well put. Thank you, both of you. Um, this is open to any of the TAs or anybody here in the room. So can we name some Mod Po poems that will come later, in later weeks? Can we name some Mod Po poems in which the poet is so convinced that imagination is powerful, is reality, that reality is actually less important, that experience is less of a guide to truth than the imagination. And nominations are open for poems. Anybody, and if you guys in the Google Hangouts have one, just wave at me. We're looking for poems that 
are Dickinsonian in the sense that they believe that imagination is reality, and everybody's looking blank, so I'm going to do one, and that would be, of course, John Ashbery's instruction manual, which is sort of the instruction manual for social construction of reality. <laughs> okay, Gabe, was that the one you were thinking of? No, I was going to say The Way by Ray Armentrout, being that it's so much about like stories, fairy tales, yes. um, storytelling, being lost in a story. So Gabe is referring to the Ray Armentrout poem that we're reading next week in week two, and she is figured as a Dickinsonian, and that's next week, and it's a very difficult poem. Jason, do you have one? We can come Gabe back. Took mine. <laughs> Who took? Gabe took Gabe yours. Took okay. Mine. Yeah. If there's another one, I'll let us know. Back. Lily, imagination. Uh, I think Erica's got one too. Yeah, I would. I don't have one. Erica, a poem in Mod Po in which imagination is more important than reality. Bernadette Mayer. Which poem? Is that the invasion the, of the body snatchers? The invasion of the body snatchers. Mm -hmm. I love that poem. Me Love too. that poem. I think that might be in Mod Poe Plot. No, it's in the regular Mod Poe. Good. Anybody else? Dave Poplar, your favorite imagination is reality poem? I was just thinking of Barbara Guest's 20. I mean, oh, that's yes. A lot of, that's a little bit more of that weird state between uh, you know, consciousness and sleep, but uh, yeah. I really think it likes to stay in that, yes. in that creative, you know, pre lucid yes. area. Um, Emily Harnett, and then we're going to move on. Um, what do you say to Ray, who's really into a kick of the social construction of reality? This poetry certainly encourages him. Are there some downsides? To a social construction of reality? Yes. Or to Ray's kick of a social construction of reality? Either one. <laughs> because Ray is listening, and he's taking notes, because when Emily talks, he listens. I don't know. I can I don't really think there's a downside, or at least that downside isn't articulated in the poems that we read. I was thinking of Sid Corman as another poem which suggests imagination is an uh, alternative or more powerful uh, place to convene than reality, and um, that's a pretty Where utopian Where do we poem. convene with Sid in that poem that we're going to read next week? Uh, in that kind of ultimate metapoetic um, here, the here, which is the the poem itself and, and the site of togetherness um, that can only exist because of the poem. So yeah, I'm, I'm all for social construction of reality in this. Carlos, <laughs> is there any downside? I mean, you do have to cross the street and a car will really hit you if, and it's reality, not imagination. Can we, can we say that at least, Carlos? Maybe. I mean, now that there's Grubhub, you don't really need to leave. <laughs> but, um. <laughs> Meaning you don't have to cross the street. Yeah. Well, you're um, funny. You're very funny. This is sorry. Carlos, everybody. <laughs> Um, downsides. I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe if you talk to Frank O'Hara, he might say, I mean, that's a very different type of, what? <laughs> Di different type of poem. Just because he got hit by a dune buggy, so the whole... Oh, no. <laughs> oh, Sorry. That's no. such I'm an amazing... That's not what I, was I don't think that say. Carlos realized That's what not said. what I was trying oh, to my say. Goodness. Okay. <laughs> someone, is, someone is on the phone, and then... I just, I want to, I want, Jason, I know you have, so, you have something to say about no. this topic. Yeah, I was just, go ahead. I was going to um, weirdly, like, suggest Frank O'Hara's Why I'm Not a Painter as relevant. Okay. Yeah, I think it is. No, is it's it? not. I was going to suggest Frank O'Hara's Why I'm Not a Painter in terms of the way in which imagination can create reality. Yes. So I was in, in thinking about the, the spreading wide of my narrow hands, which seems to be the pivot of, of tonight so far. Um, I can, I'm imagining Emily Dickinson holding one end of the paper and, and writing and moving her hand away from the other hand as words fill the page and in a way that the this kind of magical moment as the words appear from the imagination taking on material form on the page itself and becoming part of reality. Wow, that's very well said. Thank you, Jason. Um, so we have someone on the phone, but I'd also like, Jason, if you would pass the mic uh, to Eric and Mary, and then we'll put them on the spot in a minute. Um, Anna, who's on the phone? Um, we have our dear friend Eleanor calling us all the way from Australia. Eleanor Smagorinsky? Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, my goodness. Yeah, because she wants to talk about pedagogy and close reading. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to bring um, her up. Let's bring her on. All right. 
Eleanor? Hello. Hi. Listen, do you remember the first time, what, do you remember what happened the first time you called years ago? Of course. Uh, how could I forget? <laughs> well, I can't forget it either because I was very flattered. Because when my voice came up, you said, Oh my God, it's really out! <laughs> I think you might have said the phrase, Brad Pitt. <laughs> oh, Gabe is, Gabe, Gabe. I just hope she moment. remembers it too, and it's not just in your head. <laughs> the other thing about I, Eleanor and Mako <laughs> is that, what, two years ago, I was walking, my wife and I were walking up the west side. You're, you're from Australia. We were walking up the west side of New yeah. York, and there you were. I know, it was, I, I still cannot believe it. And I was actually, I was just about to get on my bike to go to Poet's house, which is like even crazier. Oh. Well, it's great. But, and I'm, also, but I'm afraid. Go ahead. Al, Al, I'm really sorry, but I, this is not all about you. I'm here, first of all, to congratulate Dr. Zuzka. I'm sorry, you're here. What? Everybody was laughing here, so I missed what you said. You're here, but what? <laughs> I'm here to congratulate the Dr. Zoska in the house. Yeah, Jason. Oh yeah. my God. I know, it's amazing. Yeah, I'm so excited for you, Jason. <laughs> Isn't that great, Jason? He's getting the mic. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're more than welcome. Yeah, I hope to see you so again good. soon, too. So well, you know me, I, I I know, I tend to pop up when you expect it, and there is a fifth birthday party coming well, up. I've heard there'll be, you know, some nice, uh, some nice games and things, so I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah. But, um, you visited the Writer's House for one of our Final Words webcasts, I, right? You know, uh, you never know. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, so I am going to, so there are some people here, Erica Kaufman from Bard, Lily, and let's just say Gabe, and Emily, everybody, um, to think about pedagogy, about teaching in relation to the Mod Po, and Eric, of course, does as well, um, and Anna. Okay, everybody thinks about it. I'm just trying to, you know, spread the fun. Um, so would you ask your question, then I'll, I'm going to ask Erica mm. to start in responding about mm. pedagogy, and then we'll get a few more responses. So go ahead, mm. Eleanor. Mm. Okay, fantastic. What I'm thinking is, and um, this is something that's come up through, you know, you asked for the crowdsourcing, and so I've become, I mean, I admit, I'm a bit obsessed with getting my friends to sit down and talk about poems. And I, I do I'm sorry, that. I, have to, I have to explain what people mean, what you mean by that to other people. So um, Eleanor has participated in the making of videos for the Triple CR, our Community Collaborative Close Readings page. And she's done maybe four or five of them, and they are linked there, and others have too. So I urge you to go there. Go ahead, Eleanor. Sorry to interrupt. No, no, no that's fine. Um, and so uh, what I was wondering is, um, are there specific ideas or tips that any of you can give to how, and I'm very specific here, how to get the people in the group to be confident enough to say honestly what they're thinking on first reading a poem or a line. I, I find that so far my challenge has been that uh, everyone, uh, each person in the group, uh, uh, you know, they put themselves down, you know, I don't know poetry, um, I'm embarrassed, uh, you know, people will mock me, etc. I'd love to know some tricks of the trade. How do you put someone at ease, and not only that, empower them yes. to believe that you know, what they say is important? That's so well asked. And I think I want to revise my structure here and just invite various people to give, us, give Eleanor and the rest of us one tip, one tool, when you're getting a discussion going, how to put people at ease. So Erica, you're first. One tool that you think is good? Um, I think that I like to just start with the most basic question of what, what's your immediate reaction? Did you like it? Did you dislike it? And then push from there. Ah. Um, I also really like to, when I do this kind of stuff, I, I myself don't reread the poem ahead of time. And, you know, I try to, oh, that's interesting. to create an ethos where we're all engaging with something for the first time. Yes, good. Those are two suggestions. Anna Strong, one suggestion 
for how Eleanor and others might just get a conversation going without shyness and reticence? Um, I would say that one that I use a lot is, um, especially like in my, in my classroom, I have um, 26 students. So that's, that's a lot of kind of voices mm. and opinions to manage. Um, I try as much as I can if I'm sort of the one like quote unquote managing the discussion, which I kind of hate doing, but if I'm sort of moderating, I guess, um, I try mm -hmm. to, um, this is going to sound really weird, but I make like really intense eye contact. <laughs> <laughs> That's scary. It is, but like I make really intense eye contact, just as like a you know I'm listening to you, I'm like engaged with you. Don't make it creepy, Al. It's not creepy. <laughs> Carlos is not creeped out by anything. <laughs> but no, it's just it just like sort of creates this like I'm listening to you, I'm engaged with what you're saying, and what you're saying is important to me. Um, and I think mm -hmm. that sort of like reinforces this. Um, you know, if, if someone's like reticent to speak, at least they know that you have like their full attention. All right, Max, a suggestion. You've done this a lot. How do you how do you keep it going? Uh, I like um, Erica's suggestion of starting with the evaluative question of like, do you like it or not? I think that's a usually a pretty good one um, because it it kind of uh, it flies in the face of of academic convention. You're not supposed to yeah. have well, your judgments of the things you study. What aren't um, you supposed to do, Max? Also... Sorry? What aren't you supposed to do? I missed that. Uh, you're usually not supposed to have uh, make value judgments on the things you study. Okay, um, you're supposed to approach it objectively. Um, okay. So asking people to make a value judgment, I think, is a good way to, to get them thinking a little bit differently than, than the way they've been thinking in order to prepare. Uh, I think also a one-sentence summary of what you read is a really good way to begin. So you say, like, how would you summarize this in this poem in one sentence? Which well, it's very difficult. And everybody will have different uh, summaries. That's really good. Um, Emily, one tool, and then we'll go to Eric. Can you get the mic to Eric? Yeah, sort of up on what Eric said. I tried uh, pretty hard and um, an explicit way to lower the stakes. So when we're dividing up words, I like to kind of toss out um, extravagantly weird, insane, kind of patently wrong uh, glosses on certain words to suggest that uh, we really are looking for the first thing um, that comes off your mind. We're really just crowdsourcing all the possible ways of understanding the poem. Mm. Oh, I Thank love you. that. Thank you. Eric, this is the last one. Um, so yesterday I was teaching graduate seminar, with, which actually has a lot of faculty members in it. And one of the uh -huh. faculty members is a poet, a wonderful poet. Um, but wasn't comfortable necessarily talking about romantic poetry. Um, I just said, well, look, just come. You don't have to say anything. And being present for long enough and feeling supported and that patience, well, by the end of the seminar, he had contributed enormously, but first he felt safe and first he felt supported and welcome to be the even if he wasn't going to say anything about 19th century poetry. Thank you. Mm. Eleanor, thanks Wonderful. for the question and thanks for calling. I hope you're going to interact with us lots and lots. Thank you very much. The, uh, those, those responses were incredibly helpful. All the best to all of you. Okay, is it, like, thank you. Is it 8 a.m. there or 6 a.m.? Uh, yes, it's 10 past 8. I, I just yeah. missed my bus into work, but that's okay. It was <laughs> well worth it. Wait, you were, you were riding a bike while doing this? Sorry? Never mind. You're on your way to work. <laughs> have, a, have a great day. Have a, have a great Thursday, Eleanor. Okay. All, all right. the best to all of you. Thank Many you thanks. so much. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, what do we have? What are you looking at, Gabe? Are you looking at the subforum? I'm looking sub at a few Yeah, I'm looking at the subforums. There's a lot of, um, there's mostly like a lot of friendly interaction between people, a lot of people getting to say hi again to each other. In fact, actually, Kirby, you got a little bit of a hello from <laughs> Ellen Dillon who says um, that it's good to see you again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and one, I mean, there's a lot of um, discussion on what we're saying. There's sort of like a live reactions feed right That's now. It's pretty cool, isn't it? Yeah, it's nice. Um, and some questions have come up, one of them being how we can deal with Dickinson's dashes and capitalizations, some of her um, less standard punctuation um, and formatting. And then from the live feeds, there's a lot of people talking about um, hearing Eleanor's question as like refreshing for them, um, and also some thoughts on Emily's narrow hands and 
what was the last one that I wanted to mention? Oh, a lot of people are, are talking about um, the question we had earlier of like social construction of reality, what some other possible ways of thinking about that might be. So some people are asking about social construction of non-reality. Um, mm -hmm. And let me try to find That's who that was. Oh yes, that was Shirley Collins who asked that. And then somebody else asked, uh, Mary Ann S. asked, um, poems that start in reality, but um, through the reader and the reader's imagination discover something else, maybe like a yeah. more solid truth, maybe. Very good. Let's take the dash and let's run yeah, with the dash. It. So Allie Castleman, Dave Poplar, Kamara Brown, will the three of you just take a shot at getting us started on a conversation about Emily Dickinson's dash? Uh, Allie, can you do something about the dash? Oh, is it cold there? <laughs> it's so cold, I'm always freezing. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah, so the dash is very open-ended. Um, it's a very open-ended way of starting the conversation about the dash. But, um, I mean, we can think about them as pauses. We can think about them as... Um, a sort of pivot in a poem. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of like to think about them as kind of continuations of a thought that aren't necessarily explicitly expressed. Great. Perfect. Thank you. That's a great start. Dave Poplar, anything about the dash that you would throw in? Um, I don't really have much to add to that other than um, like what Ali said, when you're looking at dashes in that way, what you're ultimately doing is really sort of taking them out of just a strict grammatical view and you're opening up the possibilities of them. You're using them as, as they could be used, to, you know, the, pushing the extent to which they can be used to the farthest, you know, the farthest ends that you can. So mm -hmm. I, I think it just takes it out of the world of grammar. We're so used to seeing these marks as something rigid and conveying certain meaning, but here they're almost artistic flourishes. So um, one of the thing, one of the implications of what you just said is that the dash allows us to move out of the alphabetical lexical semantic, and, and she's a, using them. She's clearly using them outside of, of that construct anyway. Yes. So it's a it's a it's an early a pre modern attempt to do something that might be purely vocal or non semantic drawing, you know, a line. Uh, almost a, a, a kind of bodily writing, a writing that's more something that the hand is doing. And in the poem where we have the hands doing some other things, there's a kind of dashness. And so there's that. And when we get to, Kamara, you're going to be next if you're okay with that. When, when we get to chapter 9.1, week 8, which is the language poets, we get to um, Susan Howe's book, My Emily Dickinson, and she's going to focus on the dash as helping hesitation. And she spends a lot of effort recuperating the idea of hesitation, which most people think of as unbeautiful, and getting us to realize that that hesitation, that stuttering, that stammering, that not being able to find the word is a beautiful thing. We were just talking about that in another context the other day. Kamara Brown, say something about the dash. Um, yeah, I was gonna talk about when I when I look at it, I I see it as like a as a big like hold, like stop, like think, understand. Okay, okay, here's a bridge to the next one. <laughs> yeah. So that like the hesitation idea is kind of what I get here. It's like a it's like a it's like a wait a second, stay here, move on. It's a hesitation. It's a it's she wants you to be in every line and every word. Mm. Well put. Well put. We have someone on the phone? We do. Um, we have Robert calling from Oakland, and he wants to talk about form in Dickinson. Great. Form. Okay. okay. So, Carlos and Jason, you're first on form. Did you say it's Robert? Hello, Robert. Hey. How are you? Uh, pretty good here. Uh, no snow here. It looks like you've got snow over in Philly there. but uh... you've, We've got what? He says it looks like we have snow. Oh, I think it's camera. leaves falling. You need to get out of Oakland more. <laughh> um, hey, Robert, is this your first time with Modpo? Uh, yes, it is. What do you think? Is it weird? I, I'm, 
having a hard time hearing what you think. Oh, what do you think? Is Modpo strange and weird? I, I, I didn't get the question. I'm, oh. I might be my phone or something. I don't know. Uh, are you using? Are you just? Are you using a phone or are you using a speaker? Oh, I'm on the phone here. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Now I can. Yes. Oh, great. I was just asking how you like Modpo. Is it weird? Is it strange? Is it unusual? It's different there, uh, but it it has some resemblance to, to kind of what happens on blogs, where there's all these different threads and comments on threads going on here. Uh, that part is more familiar there, and then you have these various. Are you saying that going into the discussion forums is something that you're roughly familiar with because you've done that kind of discussion before online? Yeah. Great. I'm glad to hear it. Well, I hope you will continue with us through the whole 10 weeks. Do you have a question or a comment? Yeah, I was thinking about, you know, we've done this one about the brain in its groove, and we've, we've actually had past discussions about it. But you were you early on in one of your early videos were talking about the importance of form in poetry. That yes. it's much about the form as it was necessarily about what was being said, or at least something yes. along that line. Yes. Yeah, uh, the rough di division was there's the what of the poem, right, and then there's the how of the poem. And I said that how we how you say what you say is more important than what you say. Right. Well, what I. It's looking at that poem this time, the first time I was realizing that in the discussions that I have heard, I've never really anyone really heard much discussion about the form of, of that poem there, which I think, I was realizing when you look at how she orders her sentence mm -hmm. in the poem there, I'm trying to pull it up here, but... Uh, Do you mean Dickinson? You, hmm? You mean Emily Dickinson? The, the, the poem about the brain is grooved, the way she, the sequence of the lines that she, the way she orders her, her, her verses there to me itself illustrates what she's talking about in the yes, poem. Yes, absolutely. In other, words, in other words, I think in the poem, the, the, poet, it's, the poem itself sort of runs off the track. Yes, absolutely. No, that's totally, because, that's totally right, Robert. I mean, she just totally subverts it because that fourth line, the fourth line that she has there, twer, uh, to are easier for you to put a current yeah. back when floods right. have slit the hills. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it, it, in terms of if you're writing in sentences, it would go with the second stanza, but she has it in the first stanza, and there's a reason yeah. she has it in the first stanza. Yes. And we, part of the reason, I think, is because it also, you could also fit it in with what she was starting with, if you, what she went, at a classic, you know, in the, you know, she's got it all rhymed with the classical poem, but in the classical poems, she starts with the first verse, and that third one could be an easier. Is fits with the initial theme about you know it's easier to have your mind running in a groove and so forth. And I think she's trying to say that, or in the poem, it starts off with that kind of approach, yes. but yes. then in the third line, you throw in the splinter, right? And the poem tries to go on, and she you know she goes on with it for one line, and then then it goes off. Yes, and, and the splinter direction. So she actually is illustrating how putting the splinter, putting the word or putting splinter into the poem at that point takes the thing in a totally different direction. Absolutely. That was so well put. We are going to make sure if, with your permission that sometime in the next months we clip this part of the webcast and use it in Modpo Plus as a wonderful explanation of that poem. Thank you, Robert. I'm going to I'm going to well, ask I'm going to ask some of the TAs here to respond further on this topic of how a poem can actually do what it's saying ought to be done. But we'll take we'll do that offline. So if you'll hang up, we'll and listen to our responses. And we want to thank you f for being part of Modpo. Okay, Al. Good good and, hearing from you. And and I hope that we'll see you when we're out in San Francisco. Okay. Well, I'm, I'll get the notice there. That would be really cool. Thank you, Robert. Thanks for calling. You're welcome. Bye. All right. That was really good reading. Anybody want to add? Lily, what does it mean when we say the poem's actually doing what it says? That, we don't, that doesn't happen with New York Times articles. <laughs> right. Um, so if, 
That would be scary. Um, well, yeah, it would be scary. We'd like the all collapse be, of the American yeah. democracy, <laughs> and the and like the article or starts like a, to fall apart. Nobody could say, and the words run out. Yeah, angry politicians would be like screaming at us, like the um, letters yeah, like in, in uh, Harry uh, Potter. Harry Potter, yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Um, I think well, so. What it means is, if the content of the poem, meaning like almost if, as you're interpreting it, the content of it is arguing for a certain approach to thinking, a certain approach to writing, a certain approach to being in the world. Um, some some types of writing follow their own advice, in, if you can think of it that way. So if a poem's advocating for open-minded thinking or um, expansive definitions of identity, something like that, if the poem, it's, if the way that the poem's constructed um, doesn't actually follow that advice the way that a New York Times article might not, um, it's different than a poem, which can be structured and organized many different ways. Um, could and it could follow its own suggestion to be structured in an open way, which kind of goes back to our conversation about dashes. Mm -hmm. um, I think ending every line with a dash in this poem, except the brain within its groove, um, kind of goes in that direction. The yeah. dash like open and um, ongoing, as opposed to a period, which is very finite. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, what I'm going to do here uh, is a invite some of the TAs to tell us about a poem in Mod Po that does, as a poem, as language, as lines, as words, as form, does what it says. Just as a teaser for people who are in week one, and we're all in week one, and who want to anticipate what's going to happen. Okay? And as you're thinking of that poem... If you're thinking of that poem, I will want to warn those who are watching on Facebook Live that we have a 90-minute limit on Facebook Live. <coughs> Excuse me, we're about to end our podcast, but we our webcast, but we won't do it before that 90-minute limit runs out. So if you're watching on Facebook, you'll lose us in about three minutes or so. And oh, it's only been an hour. I'm wrong. Stay with us. <laughs> Everything's going to be fine. Should we talk about like how this poem mm. enacts the like how does it, how, how is this it, how is this poem an example of what we're talking about? Yeah, I kind of thought that Robert did, but uh, that's good. It's worth doing for sure. Let's do it, okay? Gabe, how does and then uh, and then Max and Allie, how does this poem actually do what it says about the swerving? Well, so I think um, something that the caller was talking about was his name, Robert, you said? Robert. What Robert was talking about is um, you could imagine, hypothetically, this poem being told in two little parts. So it's in two stanzas, and you could say one stanza could be, this is when the brain runs evenly, and the second stanza is when the brain does not run evenly. It gets off the groove, right? That could be a hypothetical version of it. Um, but there's actually uh, something different from that, where the brain gets off track uh, about halfway through the first stanza. And so literally, like these like sections of the poem are not constructed in the way that the form of the poem is so wants them to be. So that's experimental in itself. Yeah. So this second um, plot line about the brain running off course is actually flooded into the first stanza, um, much like the flooding that occurs in the latter okay. part of it. Well put. Max, how does the brain within its groove, actually do what Dickinson seems to be advocating about neural pathways and all that. Uh, I don't think I could possibly top Gabe's uh, absolutely lovely reading of um, <laughs> the stanzas there. I mean, I would echo absolutely everything he says. Uh, it it swerves before it's supposed to swerve, right? So it's, uh, it's already, the brain is already out of its groove, it's already off track. Um, even before the form of the poem would lead you to believe that, even before the turn, say, between the two yeah. stanzas. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's very experimental in that way. It's, Super it's experimental. It's a poem that swerves. Uh, it's, it, I mean, it just simply swerves. Like, it, it changes before you think it's going to change. So the poem is saying, it's okay to swerve. Let your brain go. That's powerful. Oops, I'm swerving as I'm saying this. Yeah. Right? And, Ali, right. you're next. What the, what's so amazing about the poem for me is that the tropes and frameworks keep shifting. So we have groove, we have something running evenly, then we have a splinter which vocabula vocabularistically comes from some other vocabulary, and then we have a flood, which you haven't really heard about, and then the mills. 
where I mean the the as I often say the um, uh, your seventh grade teacher, if you submitted this rhyming ballad to her, would circle Mills and say, "Where did this come from? You can't introduce Mills in the last line." And what what would Emily say to that, Carlos? I'm swerving. I'm swerving, Madam M Mrs. McGillicuddy, and. Uh, my brain's out of its groove. My brain's out of its groove. So, so the mills came in because that's what's next, the mills. Allie, can you say finally something more about how this I think I'm going back to the dashes. Yes. Uh, and the question of dashes. Um, it's interesting to think about the mind having, or the brain having a mind of its own in terms of rhythm and how the dashes kind of illustrate that in the poem. So. Um, it's interesting to me that there's a dash after every line except for the first. Um, and so she starts off, uh, presumably at the beginning of her poem, having a certain place in mind where she thinks she's going. Um, and as the poem unfolds, the rhythm of the poem itself kind of takes over. That's great. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, Anna, do we have somebody on the line? We do. We have Terry calling from Dallas. And she has a lot of things to say. So. Okay. Terry, hello. Yeah. Can you, uh, let's let Chris get you your volume up a little. Can you say hello again? Hello. Yes, can you hear me? I can. Okay, is this Terry Reif? Yes. Hello. Hello. Wow, is this the first time you've called? Yeah. How does it, but you've been in the course a couple years, right? This is my third year. Yeah, welcome yeah. back. So why did you not call in previous years? I was too shy. Really? But you're not shy in the forums. You're all over the place. No. Well, that's how it is. On the internet, no one knows if you're a dog. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I'm not going to do anything with that line. So where in Texas? Out, just outside Dallas. I live very close to Shannon Rapid. Oh. Well, it sounds like you need to do a meetup. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm calling because I'm a self-appointed cheerleader for the follow button. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes. Because I think people don't know about it and <laughs> don't realize that before, you know, doing subscribe was automatic. Subscribe was automatic in the old site last right. year. Yep. So I, I'm seeing a lot of discussions die out very quickly. Because and then I look up on the follow, you know, where it says how many people are following, and it's hardly any. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very sad that you know I don't have a lot of people in there to carry on the discussion. You're understanding the situation perfectly. Let me very clearly thank you for uh, making this point. Let me very clearly say what what is our current understanding of the new site. You can subscribe to a forum at the very top, and you can follow a thread. And the way to follow a thread is to follow the first post in that thread. And that's all it is. So you are right, Terry, in pointing out the teeny weeny word follow under the first post in a thread. And if you do that, you will receive email notifications of two kinds. If you follow the forum, which is subscribe at the top, you will get a an email notification every time someone creates a new thread in that forum. Ah. If you follow a post in a thread, you will get a notification whenever anybody adds a new comment and I believe also a reply in the thread. Right. Now, for those of you who are going to be overwhelmed by all the email notifications, what I recommend you do is use some kind of filter or mailbox to move all your Modpo mail to a place in email where you can go, for me it's many times a day, where you can go at least once a day and check out your Modpo mail. And there it's okay to be overwhelmed if it's all shunted off. Yeah. Or if you're brave, have it all go to your inbox and just try to manage it. So Terry's saying something important, which is that Modpo, the center of Modpo, the, the place to be a, a citizen of Modpo is in the discussion forums. And therefore, it's really important to us that you go in and you keep in touch with the discussion as it's moving forward. 
Perfect. And so that's my suggestion. Terry, thank you so much for making that point. You're welcome. Really appreciate it. I'm going to say one more thing about forums, and then we'll get back to poetry. Um, so Coursera has created sub-forums in their new platform for us. This is the first time anyone's, still the only time any course is using sub-forums. For us, sub-forums are important because each poem has its own discussion sub-forum. And we urge people to go directly to the poem sub-forum. And if Anna or Zach or Chris and I can get enough sleep and fix this, we're going to be putting links right there on the syllabus pages to go mm. directly to the sub-forum for each poem so that we're all encouraged to go there. We urge you to go to the sub-forums for the particular poem. And that, Terry and everyone, makes it easier to follow the discussion of a single poem without having to subscribe or be overwhelmed by email notifications. We're all learning this new platform. We hope you all like the cleanliness of it, the, the logical order of it, but it's back in two, back 2012, we were all just completely at sea, and I think we're somewhat at sea now. And we apologize to rookies and first-timers who are coming in and seeing that we're not experts on our own site. It's, it, we're back to pioneer days in exploring this thing. So thank you, Terry, for calling the first time. Certainly. And, stay and while I'm on a roll, I would like to plug the Teachers Resource Center yes. and Mod Po Plus. All right, so for, to, to plug Teacher Resource Center, I'm going to turn to Erica and Max. Will you say something cheerleading-ish about that, and then we'll invite some people to say something about ModPo Plus. Erica, what is the TRC? So this year's TRC looks really different, and we've done a lot of new things that go along with the new site. For every week, you'll have a tiny little overview audio introduction starring Max and myself and we've also recorded tons of new videos and podcasts offering conversations around what you might do in the classroom with people who are in the classroom every day. That's fantastic. So the Teacher Resource Center is materials that Max and Erica and others have put together to enable teachers to use ModPo in their own classroom. And you don't have to be a teacher to go into the TRC. You can be someone who's done. that phrase close reading let's use the phrase um, collaborative interpretation in which every voice can contribute to the new interpretive whole that's what close reading is and you know when Emily was at Yale close reading is that something that happened a lot in a lot of classes not like this no. not like this and and one wonders why I mean there's nothing wrong with Yale Pregnant pause. Um, there's nothing wrong with Yale, but maybe close reading is the way to be a little more egalitarian and a little more democratic and a little more intergenerational and a little more geographically extensive as people from around the world are heartened. Like Terry, I'm calling for the first time in three years because I feel like I have something to say. Okay, I'm going to stop. That's cool. All right, so I would like to invite... Oh, we have someone on the phone? No, it's still Terry. 
Okay. Goodbye, Terry. Oh, Terry, you're on. You're still there. Would you like me to get off this phone? No. <laughs> no. Say, say one more thing about your Modpo experience. What's, what's it been like? Come on. It's, well, so many people have said this before, but it's a life changer. Really? It's, it's just like, you know, you wonder how to make friends. There's no problem here. You have There's some good many, many there. friends. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Terry, for calling. And hope you have a good evening, and we'll talk to you again soon. All right, thank you. All Bye -bye. right, thank you. I'm going to go around and invite people to say what we usually call final words, but really just a thought. Since this is week one, we have a lot of weeks to go. We're here every Wednesday doing a live webcast. We're here in the forums. We have office hours. I hope someone in their final words will push office hours. Um, I'm following the, the word MOOCs, as I told you before, in, uh, in Twitter. And a man named Ramon just, po just posted, MOOCs can transform education, but not yet. I don't know. Ter maybe he should meet Terry. <laughs> yeah, right? OK. So final words. Anybody, a thought. Uh, Emily, you're good at improvising. Um, a final thought. It's week one. Emily Dickinson, Walt Whitman, Mod Poe is straight ahead of us. What's, what's going on? What do you think? What's, what do you want to say? Well, I guess this is my fifth year doing Mod Poe, and when you do something, um, as we do, when you return to it every fall, you also have the luxury of changing your mind. And I'm feeling uh, pretty amenable to Whitman um, <laughs> this fall for Whom the first time. we haven't time. mentioned, and we must. So we haven't give, give Eric the mic so his final word can be something <laughs> about Walt, Uncle Walt. But yeah, I think uh, Emily Dickinson has always been um, a way of framing this course of... Um, Right, the how of what she says is what she says. She's so emblematic of, a, of our course for so many reasons. But teaching Whitman again, there's something um, which also feels emblematic about the kind of urgency of his generosity in that poem and his um, this uh, kind of an invitation, which is also a command to uh, collaborate <laughs> with him, to be <laughs> present with him. And, uh, and yeah, I think that's inspiring. And um, yeah, it's something I want to keep thinking about as our course goes forward. That's great. Thank you. Emily Snaps for Emily. She's great. She's always great. Carlos, final thought? Cool. Can I have two shout-outs? Two shout-outs, yeah. Quick, quick. quick, quick shout-outs. Um, the first is to uh, a guy named Diego. I'm sorry I can't remember your last name, but um, I responded to one of your posts in the forums about uh, this, the social construct of reality. Um, he was writing about basically like public and private um, in Emily's poem, I Dwell in Possibility, and sort of the ways in which um, she can explore through her imagination and the way that that's mirrored um, in the physical construct of her poem and the images in her poem. Um, and that was great. Second is to my own office hours. <laughs> um, You're shouting out to your own office my hours? My own office hours uh, to come by um, with questions, I mean, first and foremost about the poems, but also I see a lot of people um, posting creative responses to the work. Uh, their own poems that are inspired by the poems of Emily Dickinson or in response to. Um, and I would encourage people to, uh, to stop by. I will read them. I will try my best to respond to as many as I can if you bring them. Um, and that workshopping is up my alley, so that'd be awesome. Thank you, Carlos. Gabe, final thought? There's so much more. <laughs> um, also, I get, I'm glad that you get to see what's happening here now. The camera is focused on Alan, not just on me. Um, I was going to say, I, I understand for a lot of people there might be some difficulties or confusions at this point. Maybe you feel like we say something and it doesn't click with you. You're like, why? That doesn't work with me. Um, but I would really want to emphasize, and this is sort of a cliche, that there's like there are no wrong answers. I think because these poems are just as invested as in how you interface with them as we are. So um, I would allow yourself to take risks or not take risks, play, maybe play safe if you want to, um, with some of these poems and just do what you can with them. And if you feel sort of misaligned with what other people are saying, that's fine. Um, and I will also say my office hours are 3 to 4 Eastern time uh, on Tuesdays and Thursdays. That's cool. Go to office hours. They're the best. You've got to go to office hours. Lily, final thoughts. Um, 
uh, based on a conversation in English 88, which is our face-to-face -face version of this course, um, been thinking a lot about the difference between what Walt Whitman means when he says now, most like famously in this week in Canto 3, famously, what, uh, in Canto 3 of Song of Myself, um, there was never any more inception than there is now. Um, and then there's a stanza where he ends each line with now for four lines. I've been thinking a lot about what does that now mean in contrast to what Emily Dickinson's this means. Um, so I have a lot of thoughts about it. And if you want to talk to me about it, come to my office hours on Monday at 2. And I've been having pretty quiet office hours, so if nobody comes to post things, I'm just going to start posting my favorite poems and writing about them. So <laughs> it's up to wow, you guys if you have questions really cool. or if you want to jump in and find out what my favorite poems that are. That sounds really <laughs> cool. All right, Kamara, final thought. Oh, man, I took out my phone to try and find exactly what time my office hours are because I'm going to be doing office hours every other week, and they're going to be this, um, not tomorrow, but... Um, next Thursday, um, ooh, ooh, it'll come back to me. I will totally come back to you. Eric, say something about Walt Whitman and his importance to mod. So um, I want to encourage people when you read Whitman. I know sometimes when you first come to Whitman, you think, oh, this is kind of prosy in a way, or this is, you know, it, it doesn't ha seem to have the density or the suggestiveness of Emily Dickinson. I just want to say, Walt is a tricky poet. Um, what seems to be and what may be kind of depends on the way we approach the poem. I want everyone to bring their close reading attention, their imagination, the sense of possibility to all those lines. I know you can't necessarily sustain a 24-hour reading of Walt Whitman, but sustain as much as you can because there's an awful lot of the possible which depends on what you can bring to it. Very nicely put. Jason, final thought? First of all, in terms of, um, as Lily mentioned, the oh. now, no. my office hours begin relative now. <laughs> um, How did and, you do that? Well, I'm going to put down, I'm going to put the microphone on the table and run literally down the street <laughs> to my... If it's virtual, why do you have to run down the street? You're right. I'm going to run up the stairs okay. and settle in a chair. <laughs> All right, good. Um, but good. there'll be running involved, so I'll be out of <laughs> breath, but you won't know. And my office hours will be from 7 all the way to 9. So there's plenty of time to settle in. And I think in terms of form and content, which we've talked about how form can follow content, two words I use with my students are counterpoint and parallel. And that form can parallel content or form can be in counterpoint to content. Fantastic. And whether one is and, and they both create different effects. They can magnify or they can create friction. And so my challenge to everyone is we've looked at the two Dickinson poems, the, the groove and the dwell, <laughs> but um, I would challenge people to look at Tell All the Truth But Tell It Slant and tell me if it's in parallel or in counterpoint. Great. Thank you, Jason. And join Jason's office hours soon as the webcast is over. So, Anna, strong final thought? Um, I would like to just give a cheerlead for next week. Um, next week is one of my favorite weeks of the course because it just like gets so weird so fast. And what is uh, we're Next week we're looking at some Whitmanians and some Dickinsonians, the mm -hmm. idea that this like sort of binary... We're following those lines further forward in time. Yeah, and the sort of like binary idea that we've set up that there are w people who inherit you know, Dickinson and people who inherit Whitman in their poetic practice, um, you know, sort of like continue those threads, you know, into like from the people who sort of like in immediately inherited them to, you know, poets who are writing right now. Yep. Um, so it's a weird week, but it's a really like joyful, really fun week. And I just, I'm really right. excited for it. It so. is fun. And while we're talking about next week, um, net, for those of you who are writing Mod Po essays, there are four essays. And there, one will be written next week, and I'll tell you more about that in an email that I send to the whole group. If you're not getting your emails, check your, your profile, your Coursera profile. Make sure you're set to receive emails from this course, unless you can't stand my emails, in which case don't do that. <laughs> um, 
But uh, I'm going to say more about this. But we're many of us. I hope most of us are going to be writing an essay about uh, doing a close reading of Emily Dickinson next week. While for content, we're going to be talking about Dickinsonians and Whitmanians. There's someone on the phone. We're just going to say goodbye to, because we've run out of time. But who is it? Um, we have our friend Emily calling from Santa Rosa Beach in Florida. Ah, so we're going to just say hello to Emily and goodbye because we've run out of time. Emily, can you hear me? Hi, I'm sorry, you called, you called at the end and we're only going to be able to say hi and bye. Okay. I'm sorry, well, well don't, no, don't and apologize. I hope sometime you uh, get a chance to talk about uh, Christiane Miller's new collection of Dickinson poems and how that affects interpretation. Thank you. Uh, take some notes. Let's do that. But um, thank you for calling. And is this your first time in Mott or second? It is. Your first time. How did you yep. find out about us? Uh... Through Coursera, uh -huh, uh, I took Sharpened Visions, the poetry writing workshop, and several people mentioned my poem. Good. And then also your poem talk. Oh, uh, poem podcast. talk. Great. Well, thank you so much for calling from Florida, and I hope you'll call again when we have more time to take your question. All right. Question. Thank you. All right. And please, Emily, also ask your question in the forums, because it's a yeah. really, really interesting question. Yes. And nothing gets posted in the Mod Post forums without at least one response. Nothing. And usually quickly. All right. Uh, so, Allie Castleman, final thought tonight? Yeah. Um, I've just been thinking about how, I guess, we, we kind of didn't talk as much about Whitman um, tonight, but one of my favorite ways of reading him is kind of just reading him as snippets. So, not to give anyone any more, any extra work who might be writing an essay this week, but um, it might be a fun exercise to take some Whitman uh, poems and try to turn them into Dickinsonian oh, nuggets. Nice. That sounds like a cool exercise. Thank you, Allie, and thanks for joining us. Stay, uh, stay warm, I guess I need to say. All right. Thanks, Amaris, Al. thank you, Allie. Amaris Kachansky, final thought? Yeah, I guess I'll just use my final words to um, plug Modpo Plus. So if you're still curious about Emily and hungry to read more, um, you can go to resources and Modpo Plus where there's community close readings to also inspire you in case you're feeling still hesitant about being in the forums. Fantastic. Thank you for plugging Modpo Plus, a favorite of mine. Click resources on the left side of any main Modpo page, and then you'll see lots of options. One of them is Modpo Plus. Go there and look. There's more videos. There's more poems. It's amazing. You could just be there forever, and we'll keep expanding it. Dave Poplar, final thought. Uh, about the Teacher Resource Center, I had the opportunity to see a lot of the videos that are posted on the site uh, when they were recorded, and I was blown away by by Erica, by uh, Kristen Gallagher, Julia Block, and, and what you said, Al. I thought it was just a great presentation, and I wanted to emphasize, too, that it's not just for teachers. Anybody can learn a lot from, from that site, and Max and, and Erica have done a great job with it. Thank you so much, Dave. Erica, the aforementioned. Um, I would also draw your attention. Thanks for that on the Teacher Resource Center, Dave. Um, one thing that I did last night during my office hours is create some new threads in the Teacher Resource Session. Um, and the idea is that instead of sharing lesson plans, these are spaces where we can just talk about what happens when these poems enter out into the world. So I welcome anyone and everyone to just share ideas, stories, imaginings in those areas. Whether or not you're, you're a practicing teacher, you can imagine teaching scenarios. Fantastic. Thank you, Erica. Thank you so much. Max McKenna, final thought? Uh, thank you, Dave, for those nice words about the TRC. Um, I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah, I'm really excited to see um, it in action. Uh, uh, see what happens to it um, following the what Erica just said. You know, just uh, it's it's a very generative space at the moment. So we're gonna see what happens. Um, uh, a few final thoughts. Uh, I would say if this is your first time through the course, um, spend some time with the few Whitman and Dickinson poems that we have because they'll really help you going forward. Uh, I have office hours tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Central. <laughs> Um, and also, uh, I'll have, normally we'll have TRC-related office hours on Saturdays, 
but I won't have them this week because Al and I will be together in Chicago. So uh, another plug for the meetup. If um, you're in the Chicago area, please come. The details have been circulating. Uh, so uh, just keep your eyes open. Um, it's this, morning, uh, this Saturday morning at 1030. Thank you so much, Max, and I'll see you out there. Kamara, did you want to add your info? Um, yes, my office hours will be next Thursday, 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Fantastic. Um, yeah. And you've done a little bit of ModPo last year, but we really want to welcome you to the TA community in ModPo. Excited to be Thank here. Thank you. All right, so my final word, my final thought, um, something from Walt Whitman, the, one of my favorite stanzas of, of Canto 14 and Song of Myself. And it has something to do with the feeling I get when I am part of teaching ModPo. Uh, and it's this, what is commonest, cheapest, nearest, easiest is me. Me going in for my chances, spending for vast returns, adorning myself to bestow myself on the first that will take me, not asking the sky to come down to my goodwill, scattering it freely forever. Whoa, he's so hot. He's so hot. And so aside from the sexuality there, because this is a family radio station, or t television station, I want to focus on what Walt is saying and its possible connection to what we're doing together in this next 10 weeks and beyond. And that is to take higher education, which has that word higher in it, to take the concept of uh, the Ivy League, you know, Ivy covered walls and ivory towers and all that stuff. Those tropes mean something. To take what happens at a university and open it to anyone who wants to be part of it. And what may seem negatively nearest and easiest and cheapest and commonest is actually the most beautiful. That's what Walt is saying. And he goes in for his chances. If, if you're not making a mistake, you're making a mistake. Robin Hayden, who's been quoted a couple times tonight in Twitter, says, mindset equals how learners perceive their abilities if they believe their insights can be developed instead of being fixed. There's a pun on fixed. Partly uh, is the idea that there are fixed answers, meaning stable answers. But also the idea of people who maybe don't have the right interpretation and teaching used to think about maybe fixing those errors, maybe fixing that, that swerving, that wandering. What Robin is saying is that learners perceive their abilities in the process of having enough nerve to admit that they are cheapest and commonest and easiest and that that is truly beautiful and not wrong. Just as ModPo is a massive open online course which is not impersonal, so the spreading wide of the kind of e democratic quasi-egalitarian method of crowdsourcing and interpretation allows people, enables people in that Whitmanian sense to believe that their insights can be developed rather than fixed by some correctness. And it takes going outside the university to be able to realize that that's how learning can really work. And I always, when I'm saying things like this, I always like to turn to Erica who's you know, really actually at Bard doing this work, not just at Bard, but reaching out. But that's what we're all doing. So thank you to Evelyn, who's coming from all the way from Atlanta with her, all of her, her uh, what's the word? All of the, the disease studying friends. Um, and Mary, thank you for your work as CTA. Kirby, uh, Eric as always, Chris and Sophia and Robert from Oakland and Eleanor from New South Wales. Uh, in Australia and others for calling. Uh, Chris and Zach, you guys are amazing. Snaps for Chris and Zach. Anna Strong, thank you for doing the phones and for being such a great coordinator and TA. Gabe, thank you so much. Carlos, you, Emily, Kamara, Lily, Ali, Max who had to get off, Amaris, Dave, and Erica, and me from all, and, and Jason, Dr. Jason, from all of us to you. Thus is the end of the first weekly ModPo webcast, but we hope that you will come every week and join us. And for you people out in Silicon Valley, come to us live when we're out there in early October. We'll see you around. We'll see you next week from here. And we'll see you in the forums during week two and the rest of week one. Good night, everybody. <laughs>